Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reading Culture. We are continuing today in our study of Henry V by William Shakespeare. In the previous video, we looked at the very beginning of the play, where the plot is set into motion. The tenants' balls were sent to the king. The king is given assurance by his bishops that they will support him in his war and that he is indeed justified. And it seems that France is now on a collision course with England, and Henry with particularly the Dauphin, actually, the, uh, the heir to the French throne. And we see that before the next stage of the story can progress, that certain domestic matters have to be settled first. And these are introduced immediately in the prologue. If you recall, we have the character of the chorus, right, who in many ways uh, almost narrates, you could say, the play for us. So the second act of Henry V begins in this manner. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armors, the honors thought reign solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pastures now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings. With winged heels as English mercuries, for now sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilts unto the point, with crowns imperial, crowns and coronets promised to Harry and his followers, the French advised by good intelligence of his most dread preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. All right, so you get the sense of all of England is preparing for war. Uh, <clears throat> right, every, every, all the armorers are at work, uh, right, every thought is turning to honor, right, people are, right, selling the pasture, they're no longer farming because they're going to buy a horse, right, for war. That's, that's kind of the, the state of the country. And then he goes on. O England, model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart. What mightest thou do that honor would thee do for all thy children kind and natural? In other words, although you're small in body, as I say, you're a small island, it has a much smaller population than, say, France. It is large in heart. And what could you not do if, right, what could you not do? were all thy children kind and natural. Well, we're now going to see examples of children that are not kind and natural. But see thy fault. France hath in thee found out a nest of hollow bosoms, which he fills with treacherous crowns, and three corrupted men, one Richard Earl of Cambridge, and the second Henry Lord Scroop of Masham, and the third Sir Thomas Grey, Knight of Northumberland, have for the guilt of France. Oh, guilt indeed confirmed conspiracy with fearful France, and by their hands their grace of kings must die, if hell and treason hold their promises, ere he takes ship for France and in the Southampton. Linger your patience on, and will digest the abuse of distance, force a play, the sum is paid, the traitors are agreed, the king is set from London, and the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse now, there must you sit, and thence to France shall we convey you and bring you back, charming the narrow seas, to give you gentle pass. For, if we may, we'll not offend one's stomach with our play. But till the king come forth, and not till then, unto Southampton do we shift our scene. So, we get this description of these traitors, right? And we get, we get a pun here, the sense of, for the guilt of France, guilt, if you think of gilding, right? For something to be guilt, right? The gold, for the gold of France. And then, oh, guilt indeed, right? Of course, the other kind of guilt. Right, so they confirmed conspiracy with France against the king. And we now see that this is about to come to a uh, point ahead, as it were, with the king. And we we get a sense, too, of the the purpose of, again, the chorus here, which is, is manifestly calling attention to the fact that the figure and the of Henry and the actions are bigger than the stage can contain, but saying that you must write it imagine that you will be transported to Southampton into France. It won't bother your stomach, the sea journey, because of the staying where you are. So it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting calling attention to the conventions of the stage. So in the first scene, Act 2, Scene 1, we get the introduction of the uh, so-called low characters. We have Corporal Nim and Lieutenant, Lieutenant Bardolph. So Bardolph is a character from Henry IV, part one and two. He is a associate of Falstaff and a friend, or was a friend of Prince Hal, as he was known at the time. And uh, right, known for this pretrescence on his nose, it's always bright red. Um, but the main thing is to understand that these were the king's companions. But he, 
as mentioned in the previous videos, right, he shook them off. And indeed, you could think of it that when he said to Falstaff, I know thee not, old man, he really was saying that to all. And it's, uh, right, it's a fairly humorous scene in many ways, even though there's actually a great deal of tension. Uh, it seems that uh, Corporal Nim had been set to marry Mistress Quickly, another character. She runs a tavern where Prince Hal is usually uh, cavorting with Bardolf and Falstaff and others. Um, and that she broke that kind of agreement and ended up, ended up marrying Pistol, often referred to as Ancient Pistol, a more comic character. And so they didn't really come into blows, and Bardolph was trying to uh, hold them off. The real significant point, perhaps, for us in this scene uh, comes with the entrance of the boy. Uh, so when the boy comes in, this is maybe around line 85 or so, right? He, he comes to say that uh, Falstaff right, is very, very ill in bed. We get this very important line where Mistress quickly responds by saying, this is at line 92, the king has killed his heart. So we already looked in the previous video at the future deaths, which could be attributed to the king's actions through war. But here we see a death that's attributed to him through this kind of shaking off of Falstaff. Now, if you were to read the previous two plays, you would know that Falstaff, you know, it is a drunkard and a thief and a liar. And yet there is a sense that he has, you know, this this kind of almost a heart of gold under all of that. Um, so we can we can question whether or not the king is justified in this throwing off, which kills his heart, or if this is something perhaps that we should reproach him for. But in the end, the uh, scene moves on to Southampton and the council chamber. We get the introduction of the king and his uh, various nobles who are aware of this treacherous conspiracy, this plot against the king. And the king himself enters, already aware of this plot, with the traitors themselves, but putting on an aspect of uh, earnest regard, you could say. So, the very first issue that comes up is they're having a discussion about a man who apparently was drunk and made disloyal comments against the king. And so King Henry says this at about line 40. Uh, Uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on. And on his more advice, we pardon him. So we're going to pardon this, this fellow. Lord Scrooge, remember one of the traitors, responds, that's mercy, but too much for purity. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferings more of such a kind. King Henry, and you can just, you can feel the irony here, says, oh, let us be merciful. To which Cambridge, another one of the traitors, responds, so may your highness, and yet punish too. And Gray agrees, the third traitor, sir, you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. So here are these three traitors who have conspired against the king, and they do not know they've been found out. So they, at this point, believe that their plan will come to fruition, they're saying that it would be too much mercy to uh, pardon this right, drunken railer, but that he should be punished. Right, and, and King Henry is tongue dripping with sarcasm, you can almost imagine it, although hidden, so right, perhaps that's not even the right word, um, but a kind of hidden irony. Uh, Alas, your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. If little fault proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at, how shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes chewed, swallowed, and digested appear before us? Well, yet enlarge the man, though Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our person, would have him punish. So here we see, it's almost like he's heaping coals on their heads, saying, despite your care for me, uh, which leads you to an over... Uh, blown sense of uh, severity, right? Yet I will be merciful and pardon him, knowing full well that they have in fact betrayed him. So they're given papers, which are supposed to be indicating what their actual, uh, you could think of the equivalent of their orders as it were for the war. Um, but in fact, they reveal that they are charged with treason. And so we see this change, right? 
the king who's been playing with him this whole time is about to reveal that he knows all. So he says, this is at about line 73 or 72. When see, what see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? Look ye how they change. Their cheeks are paper. Why, what read you there that hath so coward and chased your blood out of appearance? The, the color is draining from their eyes as they realize they've been found out. They immediately confess. I do confess my faults, as Cambridge, and do submit me to your highness's mercy. The other two agree, to which we all appeal. And now Henry will unleash his wrath against them. The mercy that was quick in us, but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy. For your own reasons, turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters, worrying you. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. Right, so right at the outset, first of all, he says, how dare you for shame talk of mercy when you yourselves moments ago cried out that mercy was indeed not the course that should be followed. And again, these English monsters, this is a very patriotic play. It's very much pro-English, anti-French. And yet Shakespeare is saying, oh, England, what could you be if you did not have these people with you know, hollow bosoms, right? If all men were faithful, right? There's a sense that there's these, right, these English monsters which are betraying the very uh, soul of the nation almost. So he goes on. My Lord of Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord to furnish him with all appurtenance belonging to his honor. And this man hath for a few light crowns lately conspired and sworn into the practices of France to kill us here in Hampton, to the which this knight no less for bounty bound to us but than Cambridge is hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop, thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature? And again, more a language of monstrosity. There's a sense that right, this kind of treason against one's natural lord, whom one has sworn fealty, is is inhuman, right? There's, there's a monstrous, savage, inhuman aspect to it. Keep in mind, of course, that in this period, uh, this kind of loyalty to rightful authority uh, is considered one of the highest virtues, and indeed the betrayal of it, one of the worst. There's a reason why, for instance, in Dante, that great late medieval poem uh, of his, The Divine Comedy, why, in the final circle of hell, it's traitors. It's Judas who betrayed Christ, and it's Brutus and Cassius who betrayed Julius Caesar, who are actually in the mouth of Satan. He's kind of chewing on them. Right? So this, this kind of disloyalty is really seen as, as monstrous in a very real way. And he goes on, he says, Thou that didst bear the, keys, the key of all my counsels, that knew us at the very that knew the very bottom of my soul, that almost might have coined me into gold, which to have practiced on me for thy use. May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger? Tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Treason and murder ever kept together, as two yoke devils sworn to either's purpose, working so grossly in a natural cause that admiration did not whoop at them. That thou gainst all proportion didst bring in wonder to wait on treason and on murder. And whatever cunning fiend it was that wrought upon thee so preposterously hath got the voice in hell for excellence. All other devils that suggest by treasons do botch and bungle up damnation, with patches, colors, and with forms being fetched from glistering semblances of piety. So their piety, right? It's only a semblance. But he that tempered thee bade thee stand up, gave thee no instance why thou shouldst do treason, unless should dub thee with the name of traitor. If that same demon that hath gulled thee thus should with his lion gait walk the whole world, he might turn, he might return to vasty Tartar back and tell the legions, I can never win a soul so easy as that Englishman's. So he's saying that, right? You had all my counsels. You, you seemed pious. These devils, these demons at you, again, with lion gait, referring to uh, the lion of the Bible, where the devil is described as prowling around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? And then we get this. Reference to Legion, another biblical reference, the demon who responds, how many, what are you? I am Legion. And this reference to Tartar, right? is, which is Tartarus, right? The deepest, uh, darkest place of the ancient uh, classical uh, Hades, uh, right? And, and again, this, this kind of brag, I can never win a soul so easy as an Englishman, as, or as that Englishman, saying that this 
Englishman. And again, it's, it's important he uses the term Englishman here, emphasizing his Englishness and this portrayal of his people, um, right? That you were so easily won that the demons themselves brag of it. Oh, how thou hast with jealousy infected the sweetness of Athens. Should men dutiful? Why see, show men dutiful? Why so didst thou? Seem they grave and learned? Why so didst thou? Come they of noble family? Why so didst thou? Seem they religious? Why so didst thou? Right. So in other words, he's saying that you seem to be everything I should be able to trust. In other words, if I cannot trust you, who seemed all, how could I trust anyone? All right. So he goes he goes on for uh, for a bit here, uh, very much in the same vein. And then the his uncle, the uh, Earl of Exeter, arrests them all and charges them with high treason. And it's, their response is very interesting. So Scrooge says, our purpose is God ha justly hath recovered. And I repent my fault more than my death, which I beseech your highness to forgive, although my body paid the price for it. So in other words, he's actually not indicating there's anything unjust happening here. He's in fact saying it, and in fact is just, this has been found out, even though he will die. Cambridge likewise says, for me, the gold of France did not seduce, although I did admit it as a motive, the sooner to effect what I intended. But God be thanked for prevention, which I in sufferance heartily will rejoice, beseeching God and you to pardon me. So in other words, uh, he's indicating that it was not greed that did it, it was his purposes. Well, what are those purposes? Well, as you may remember from the intro video to this play, uh, this is the fourth in a tetralogy. And what we see in this tetralogy is the usurpation of the throne of Richard II and the play Richard II by Henry V's father, Henry IV. Him seizing of the throne and constantly having to fight off, consequently, people who would rather like to see it restored. Um, to something closer to the original line, um, even though they're all related, of course. So in this case, uh, the Lord here is arguing, Cambridge is arguing that, uh, right, it wasn't greed. He, was, he just wanted the money to affect his purpose. His purpose would be to put a relative of his on the throne and uh, probably ultimately it would result in his son actually becoming king. So there's a sense that there's, again, Behind all this treason is a previous treason, which Henry has inherited. But he still right, uh, says that he thanks God that it was prevented and uh, asks for pardon. And Gray likewise says, Never did faithful subject more rejoice at the discovery of the most dangerous treason that I do at this hour, joy or myself, prevented from a damned enterprise, my fault, but not my body, pardon sovereign. In other words, he's basically saying he's not even asking that his body be pardoned. In other words, that he be spared from execution, but rather that his fault, please at least forgive me before I'm sent to die. And King Henry responds thusly. God put you in his mercy. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed and from his coffers received the gold, golden earnest of our death. Wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter, his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. But we, our kingdom's safety, must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. Get you therefore hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof God of his mercy give you patience to endure and to repentance of all your dear offenses. Bear them hence. So he says, I seek this not out of revenge for myself. But rather, it is to protect my realm that I do this. And then he says, I turn you over to the law. Which, of course, death is the penalty for treason. Right. So indicating again that this is this is a just act. And he even commends them to God, saying that he hopes that they will be they will be able to properly endure their execution and that. They will repent themselves. And so they are led away. Now he says, now, Lord, for France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as us like glorious. We doubt not of a fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. We doubt not now, but every rub is smooth on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight into expedition, cheerly to see the signs of war advance, no king of England, if not king of France. So here we get the final hurdle is overcome. The, uh, right, the traitors are dealt with, and now it's off for France. Again, no king of England, not king of France. This is, again, an active 
character. This is not a character whose vices and virtues are of a soft or passive nature, right? It is all action with him. In the next scene, scene three, we return to the tavern with Pistol, uh, the hostess, Nim, Bardolf, and the boy. And here we find that, in fact, uh, Falstaff has died. And so we see, again, the consequences of the king's actions. Now, this is not exactly the same thing, of course, as sending traitors to their death uh, by any means. Um, one could, of course, argue that being, again, put away by the king was entirely justified because of the loose actions of Falstaff. But there is still a question of, of you know, how, how, as we see these uh, uh, friends uh, together lamenting the death of Falstaff, what are we to think of it? Are we to think of this as something we too should lament, as, as simply justice? Well, in the end, they prepare for war. They too are joining the king in his exposition. And we come to the final scene, scene four of Act Two. And we finally get a sense of what the French are up to. And we're introduced indeed to the French king. And not only the French king, but the French king's perception of Henry. So the first, uh, the scene starts with the French king saying, Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defenses. Therefore the dukes of Berry and Britannia and Brabant and Orléans shall make forth, and you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch, to line in new repair our towns of war, with men of courage and with means defen defendant. For England his approaches makes as fierce as watchers to the sucking of a gulf. It fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us out of late examples left by the fatal and neglected English upon our fields. You see, he's taking this very seriously, right? and they're, they're preparing for war. And Duff, on the other hand, does not quite have the same view. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe, for peace itself should not so dull a kingdom. No war, nor nor known quarrel were in question, but that defenses, musters, preparations should be maintained, assembled, and collected as were a war in expectation. Therefore, I say, tis meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France, and let us do it, and with no show of fear. No, with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Whitson Morris dance. It's a traditional folk dance um, done around with Sunday at religious feasts. For my good liege, she is so idly kinged, her scepter so fantastically born, by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous, humorous, humorous youth, that uh, fear attends her not. In other words, he's saying, we don't need to fear England. She's idly ruled. Her king, right, it, like, it's fantastical who, the person who actually holds the scepter, right? He's vain, he's giddy, he's shallow, he's humorous. This is the kind of youth that rules. And this could all potentially, you could argue, be a fair description of the character of Prince Hal, at least in moments of the Henry IV plays. But the King of France does not view things quite the same way. He responds by saying uh, that we think we King Harry strong, and princes look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us, and he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captived by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. Right, so basically he's referring to an earlier time in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, another generation, in fact, where the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales, the heir to the English throne, won a great battle at Cressy, which devastated the nobility of France. Whiles that his mountain sire, that's the sire of the Black Prince, Henry V, on a mountain standing up in the air, crowned with the golden sun, saw his heroical seed and smiled to see him mangle the work of nature and to face the patterns that by God and by French fathers had 20 years been made. Um, right, that's that's this the the young men right dying in the field. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. So he, the king of France, is the opposite view, right? He fears him quite greatly, and he fears his native mightiness, the mightiness which is native to England. So this is even because remember, of course, this is an Englishman writing it. So you know, even the other side recognizes the mightiness of England and the fate of him. There's a sense that he is fated. Um, in his course. Now we get the admit, admittance of the uh, of ambassadors from the King of England, uh, which is his uncle Exeter. He uh, accosts the king, you could say, and tells him what it is that Henry requires, namely that he give up his French throne. He says, right, Henry is claiming it. He presents him with a paper saying 
here is the lineage of Henry that shows that he is the rightful king of France. Um, so give up your uh, claim to the French throne. And the king asks, what else follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel, and bids you in the bowels of the Lord deliver up the crown and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. And on your head turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim. This threatening and my message. So there's a sense that, right, again, even if you hide the crown in your heart, he will rake to get it. That's how determined Henry is that the crown will be his. And he's described in these almost divine terms, right, like a Jove, like Jupiter, the god. In thunder and earthquake, he's coming in a fierce storm. And he's saying, again, deliver the crown out of thought, for they have mercy on the poor souls in this hungry war. People are going to starve because famine is often the result of war. Um, right? There's going to be widow's tears and orphan's cries, right? Dead men's blood, pining maiden's groans, fathers are going to, husbands will lose, uh, right? The groans will be for husbands and fathers and betrothed lovers, right? They should all be swallowed up in this controversy. But again, he's not saying that this is in some ways his fault, but rather that this is in the hands of the king. The French king should have mercy on all these people who will die and suffer and starve by giving in. And basically, if he does not give in and this all comes to pass, then in fact, is the French king's fault for not yielding. And then we get another message for the Dauphin, who asks, right, what to him from England? And Exeter says, this is at about line 115 or so, uh, that the message is scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the, the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Thus says my king, and if your father's highness do not in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, the tennis balls, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second ascent of his ordinance. In other words, he's basically saying that not only does the king have to give in, but he has to make amends for this mock. And if not, all of France will pay. The Dauphin is not moved. He responds, say if my father render fair return, it is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. To that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris balls. And this is the response. He'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it. And this time the Louvre was not a museum, it was the royal palace. We're at the mistress court of mighty Europe, and be assured you'll find a difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found, between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he weighs time even to the utmost gain, grain, that you shall read in your own losses if he stay in France. In other words, he's saying that he may also think that he's, you know, like he was. This, And it seems that he does. He seems to think he's the same kind of youth, I, idle and shallow. And he's... The, the ambassador, uh, Earl of Exeter here, is admitting that his own subjects have been in wonder at this transformation, right? The promise of his greener days, his younger days, didn't seem very promising, right? But now he masters the days in an entirely different way, right? And there's a sense that you will see it in the losses if he stays in France. So the king says that tomorrow the ambassador should know his mind at full. And uh, right, Exeter is, is dispatched back to where he comes from. And the scene, uh, the act, in fact, ends with the French king saying, you shall soon be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A knight is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of su of this consequence. So it seems, in fact, that the French king is really willing to consider uh, another course of action here. The Dauphin is not. Right? He's youthful and he's warlike. Now, so is Henry. But Henry, again, about the age of 27, is closer in age to, of course, the Dauphin, despite being king, than the king of France. So there's a sense, perhaps, that this is really a question of age and experience versus youth. That the king of France, who certainly seems willing to avoid war, uh, does so because his experience tells him that that is the prudent course, whereas the younger men are all too willing. But certainly it is a question. We see both aspects here. We see a Hal who's playing a kind of cat and mouse game with the traders, or he's very cunning, 
even duplicitous in some senses, right? He was very much set on more, even though he knows the consequences and is uh, right, very aggressive. But we also see one who's just and praised for his justice and his nobleness, even by his enemies. So we will see how this actually manifests itself in the field when the actual war begins in the next act. And in the following video, we will consider exactly what is this war in France? Is it truly a righteous undertaking or something else?